With it being a beautiful day out here in Florida, it's actually kind of cold today, but I thought it would be interesting to talk about when is it that Yu-Gi-Oh! officially changed and became modern Yu-Gi-Oh!, aka the game that we know it as today and not the 2005 old school Go format days. So let's dive on into it, shall we? Hello, ladies and gentlemen, it is your host with the very windy most, Avery LR32 here, and destroy the ever-living boo-boo stain off of that subscribe button as the wind blows my hair every which way, and we can climb even further beyond the 1K ladder. We're so close to 1,100. I'm tempted to make me five alternate accounts to get myself to 1,100, but <laughs> besides the point, don't do that. I'm pretty sure I can get banned for saying that, but anyways, I wanted to talk about when is it that Yu-Gi-Oh! officially changed from being the old school, you know, summon a monster, set a couple back row and end my turn, to the <laughs> just build a board and drop a dookie on the field, as we like to say. And I think that the key point where the game just changed on a dime, and I believe I've said this before, I could be wrong, but for all the new people, all y'all in the back of the room, or whatever the saying is, <laughs> I believe that it changed in 2013 with the Dragon Rulers. If you look back at the history of Yu-Gi-Oh!, you know, you even look at something like 2012 when we got the Abyss Rising Core booster set and we had Mermels running around and we had some other decks in the format and things like that. But even the boards that Mermel was able to make and the plays that they could do were not that far-fetched. You know, this is back in a time when a card like Call of the Haunted was good. And I say Call of the Haunted was good because Mermel literally got a continuous trap that was basically a Call of the Haunted on steroids. And for years, I said that that card needed to go to one or be banned. I hated fucking Mermel. And like Abyss Megalo was an OTK card. And for a while, the deck was basically just Abyss Megalo OTK the deck. And you know, this was back in a time for me where I was in high school. You know, I, I don't even think I was working a part-time job at that point, my first part-time job. So I couldn't afford, you know, things like Mermel when the deck was like five hundred plus dollars. People getting all these max rarity, you know, dragoons and uh, what was it? A, a dragoons, abyss dragoons, whatever it was. Atlantean dragoons. That's what it was. Getting their max rarities and shit, two hundred plus dollars, like a thousand dollars for max rarity of uh, Mermel deck. Um, but the deck was, you know, cool in its own right. You know, it could OTK with Abyss Megalo and things like that, and like Mono Glacia plays. Uh, Jesus, I don't know what that boom was, <laughs> but um, you know, that wasn't too far fetched. But then you fast forward to the Dragon Rulers, when we got the babies, we got the big dragons, three of everything, it was tier zero, we got fucking Spellbook of Judgment out here, tapping people's asses left and right, and like, it was disgusting. Now, you look at like, you compare Dragon Rulers 2013, even with Vanity's Emptiness, compared to the format we have now with Kastira just locking out all your zones, and like, you may think, Avery, it doesn't seem that busted. In comparison, it doesn't seem that busted, ladies and gentlemen. You have to understand that the idea of building a board or this concept of build a board and see if you can break through my castle was really not that big of a thing until we hit Dragon Rulers because, you know, we still had the draw six on your first turn. So if you went first and you were the Dragon Ruler player, you got to draw six cards. You had three copies of Sacred Sword of Seven Stars. You had Vanity's fucking emptiness as a broke ass uh, floodgate. You had Super Rejuvenation. You had the White Stone of a Legend engine. You had all of these things to where you could draw like 10 to 15 cards. Oh, and you had Max C <laughs> just as icing on the cake. And it's like, bro, like, what are we doing? So, like, your end board could be anything from, like, dropping out a Draco Sack with a couple tokens and some back row because the deck could play Phoenix Wing Windblast because it didn't give a fuck if the dragons were in the graveyard, or a Raigeki Break or anything like that. Later on, you got Sixth Sense, which instantly went to one when we got Joey's World because Konami knew that that shit was broke AF. And, like... It just got crazier and crazier. And then, like, you know, you fast forward to 2014 where you had the Galaxy Eyes Dark Matter Dragon Dragon Ruler builds. And even then, like, it was kind of a good deck. But the, even that format was more balanced and more slow than 2013 because, you know, you had the Hat deck and you had Gear Gears, which were doing some shenanigans, but they were kind of like sub terrors before sub terrors were a thing. And from there, it just got crazier and crazier and crazier. You look at 2015, then we got Necroz. 2016, we got, as my friend calls it, PP One Touch, aka Pepe, aka Perform a Pal Performages. And like you can see where things start to get out of control. 2017, Spiral Tier Zero format. Hello, at that point we have Link Monsters, Zodiac Tier Zero format. Like 
do you see now like the progression and if you watch my retrospective series you're probably familiar with this you know you look at 2002 when everybody's playing summon skulls and dark magicians and blue eyes and beating down your ass and stuff like that and like it's very basic like you're summoning a battle ox you're setting a trap hole and you're passing turn you know there was no ban list really until 2004 i mean you had cards that were limited and things like that but we didn't actually get cards banned until 2004 and, you know, you look to something like 2005, even with Go Control, I mean, that was slow. Like what? You're going to set a spy, set two in your back row, and tell the opponent to go. Maybe you hit them with a delinquent duo. Maybe you go Pot of Greed, which, in case you didn't know, let you draw two. <laughs> so, it just got progressively more insane. And then you hit Dragon Rulers. And the power gap at that point, you know, we were talking about 2012, you know, Mermails. The power gap is here or the, rather the power levels here, and then Dragon Rulers just, <laughs> just exploded like Goku doing a Kaioken, and it was absolutely bonkers, and it was complete tier zero, you know, and you could even compare like slower formats that we've had since then are still faster than their predecessor. You know, I would argue that uh, hat format, and I think many people would agree to this, hat format is a faster format than GOAT control format, or April 2005, whenever that format was, I don't remember off the top of my head because just the cards kept on getting progressively better and better and better. And so, yes, we've had control formats or, you know, slower formats since Dragon Rulers, but I don't think anything will ever be like, God, even 2006, I would say, would be like the last slow format. Because you can't really say 2007 was a slow format because you had Airblade Turbo, aka Diamond Dew Turbo running around with Demock and uh, Divine Sword Phoenix Blade, shit like that, Triple Stratos. 2008, you had Teleport Dark Arm, or no, I'm sorry, it was Dad Return. Then once we got the Synchro stuff in like late 2008, early 2009, it became Teledad, aka Teleport Dark Arm. That deck was hella fast. You had Crush Card Virus as a fucking prize card, like $1,000. And so, like, if you want a format where you are summoning a monster, setting a couple back row, telling the opponent to go, and you find out within, like, maybe 15 to 20 minutes if you've lost the game instead of by turn one or turn two, I would say really 2006 all the way back to 2002. Within that time period is when the game would, I guess you could consider old school Yu-Gi-Oh!, because, I mean, 2007 is, I feel like, where really things start to ramp up. And it was slowly but surely progressing and getting just a little bit faster, a little bit faster. But then once you hit that Dragon Ruler peak at 2013 with three babies, three big dragons, I think we even had triple Vanity's Emptiness. You had Key Beetle Lock to lock out the fucking Vanity's Emptiness so it couldn't even be popped by card effects, which is still disgusting to this day. Like, could you imagine? Could you imagine if you're trying to get rid of someone's Rivalry or Gozen or TC Boo and someone just goes... Key Beetle, lock it out, it can't be destroyed by card effects. How do you get rid of that? Like, you have to tribute it off with, like, Unexplored Wind if you're playing Flunder. And, like, other than that, how do you really get rid of the card? Feather Duster can't do it, can't be destroyed by card effects. What you, what you gonna do? And the Floodgate just sits there saying, hey, bro, you gonna finish that pizza? So, <laughs> I feel like Dragon Rulers is really what tipped everything. And then, I wouldn't really say that there's been another point where the game's gotten faster. However, the power creep as a whole has definitely gotten worse. We have gone from, and I forget who said this, but they made a really good point. But they said that we've gone from power creep being a year-over-year -year thing to, like, maybe every few core sets to now it's, like, set to set to set. It's a brand new power creep. We got Power of the Elements. That was a power creep. Darkwing Blast was kind of a power creep, not really, but we got Kashtiras introduced. We got the Buy Steals. That's another level to the power creep. We got... Photon Hypernova, which introduces Kashtira as a tier one deck and is now just locking out three zones, sometimes five, depending on how they open. And so you can just see the power creep ramping up. And yes, a card like Time Rendering Organite and Cyberstorm Access is meant for more slower decks and stun decks and things like that. But you can't tell me, just at face value, a card that lets you draw two during your standby, normal summoner set twice, and then if you ditch a copy of it from your hand and then banish another copy from your grave, that every time you normal summoner set that turn your opponent can't activate monster effects is not disgusting because it is disgusting even if it's only played in slower decks you know you're gonna see slower decks like stun sub terror uh i wouldn't even really say gadgets but just like more roguish stuff be a contender potentially just because of that card and it's also a normal spell so triple tactics thrusting can get you to it in case you're going second <laughs> you can just you know play the sucker if your opponent has a monster but guys, let me know what you think about this. Do you feel like Yu-Gi-Oh! became more modern, quick Yu-Gi-Oh! faster play in a different time period? I feel like just really 2013 is what set it 
off and that we've just been in this modern Yu-Gi-Oh era ever since. That's not necessarily a good or a bad thing. People are going to miss the old school days, and I do to a degree miss those old school days. At the same time, being able to have the ability to play decks like Kashtira, Sprite, Tri Brigade, these decks are fun to play in their own right, and I think that shouldn't go unnoticed. You know, I feel like people would eventually get bored of Goat Control. You know, could you imagine if for over 25 years now, we only had Goat Control to play with and we never got anything else new? I, like, people would get burned out. So, guys, let me know what you think down in the comments. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.